Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would grab your Bible, turn to James chapter 2. We will be concluding James chapter 2 today. Uh, this is part of uh, the work we've been doing through the book of James in our sermon series called Real Faith. And that's what James is aiming at uh, instilling in his readers then as well as us today. We worked our way through verses 14 through 19 last week. And we're going to pick up in verse 20 and work through the end of the chapter, verse 26 today. But I do want to begin our reading this morning in verse 14 that will hopefully remind us of some of the things we talked about last week and then lead right into our material today. So James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, hear now the word of the true and living God. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a, faith, that, that, you see that a person excuse me, is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let us pray. Indeed, Father, as always, we are grateful, uh, gratefully thankful that you have seen to it that your word has come down to us today. We pray that as we consider and contemplate your word before us this morning, that we would allow your word to shape and to transform us into people who put our faith into action. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cement, if it is not mixed with water and sand, will remain cement. You will not get concrete if all you have is a bag of cement and you don't mix it with water, and sand. If you want concrete, you got to take the cement and add the water and the sand. This is an illustration of what James is exhorting his brothers and sisters to. They are claiming to have a concrete faith. And James is saying to them, well, I, I hear you. you. You have the cement. You have God is one. Where's your water and your sand, which are your works? You're claiming to have concrete. I don't see that because you don't have the fundamental, necessary items that make up concrete faith, which are the works. Show me. That has been James's two-word sermon in this section of the epistle. Show me. And, and there are a number of terms here that, that are important to identify. Good works, or works as James is describing them here, would be, well, those uh, actions that God 
has called Christians to be engaged in, works that he has revealed in his word. They're also, these works, are the things that Christ himself engaged in while he was here during his earthly ministry. They are not works that we just come up with on our own, that are the invention of our human, fallen, finite minds. And we also need to be careful how we identify and define the term justified as James is using it here in this context. It is similar to the way Jesus, his half-brother, uses it in the Gospels when he says, you see that wisdom is justified by her actions. It's not that wisdom is somehow declared righteous before God based on actions. But rather, wisdom is seen to be wisdom, is shown to be wisdom, to the people who observe it, based on their actions. And in a similar way, that again is how James is utilizing this word justified in this context. The claim that we are in relationship with God and that we have real, true, genuine faith toward God, that claim is shown to be true, is shown to be right, based on our behavior, and the actions, the works that we are engaged in. If we don't have those works, while at the same time claiming to have this real faith, James is telling us that's useless. That's verse 20. Do you you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? This is a repetition of verse 17, just stated in a little different way. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So here, even with the word faith, we have to be careful in making sure that we are recognizing how James is utilizing that term in this context. There's a couple different ways that it's being utilized here. You're claiming to have this real faith, and yet the faith that you actually have doesn't have works. That's a dead faith. That's a useless faith. In contrast to real, true, genuine faith, even the faith of Abraham, as we're going to see here, which does have works, and therefore shows that it actually is what it is, which is, again, real faith. We've seen, as we've been working our way through this text, James has utilized a practical argument. If you see a brother or sister and and they lack the bare necessities of life, food and clothing, and all you do is say, fill yourself, warm yourself. Seriously? That, that's not faith. Not, not real, true, genuine, saving faith. That's dead faith. That's useless faith. And then he's progressed into the theological argument, which centered on, you're, you say that God is one. There's only one God. Hey, well, well and good. That's problem is, that kind of faith is, is on par with demonic faith. Even the demons believe, and the hair on the back of their neck stands up. They shudder, terrified, before a just and holy God. And now, as we conclude this chapter... James moves now to the scriptural argument, and he brings two examples from the Hebrew Bible to bear on the the situation. One is Abraham. He spends a few verses working through Abraham. And a very well-known episode in the life of Abraham. And then, for just a verse, we have Rahab. A woman who may not be as well-known, perhaps. And I think that's part of the argument, is James presents, hey, you guys know Abraham, right? That's the big dog, right? That's that's the father of the faithful. How do you not know Abraham? And look, do you not want to... Here's here's the case study. Here's the the point of what I'm saying from Abraham. Someone might say, well, yeah, of course, but that's Abraham, right? I'm, I'm not an Abraham. Okay, Rahab. And And here's this... She, she 
is described here as a prostitute, so she's got some uh, moral issues in her background. She's a sinner, just like Abraham was, but some people's sins are conspicuous, right? They're, they're well known. And she's also a Gentile. She's, she's not a Jewish person. She's outside of the nation of Israel. Abraham's the father of the nation. She's outside of it. And yet, she is an example of faith and works going together. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Do you want to be shown? What has James been talking about this whole time? Show me. Well, let me show you, right? You foolish person, very interesting term here, um, you empty-headed person. Um, one translation I found, it said, oh, ignoramus, all right? Um, James not pulling any punches, all right? He is he's really uh, tamping down here. That faith apart from works is useless. Um, by the way, if they say no to this, they, they really, you, you can't say no. You can condemn yourself if you answer this in the negative. So, of course, yeah, okay, show, show us. Show us, demonstrate it. Uh, show, um, a no answer would show that they're really unwilling to do what God would have them to do. That they are content with their said faith, which is a dead faith. But a yes would say, you know what? Mm, I'm convicted here, and I, I, need, I need further instruction. That, that's a good place to be in, by the way. Uh, when, when the Scripture is brought to bear on your life, brother, sister, you better not say, get that out of here, right? No, I don't want that. We need to be people who say, yes, Lord, show me. So, uh, verse 21 picks up the, the first example. This runs through verse 24. Uh, 20, verse 24 is, is the, uh, the summary of the, the example here. But it is Abraham. Abraham, our father. We've, we've talked about how James is a Jewish Christian. He's writing to probably a predominantly Jewish church at this time, very early in uh, the history of the church. Um, Abraham justified by works when? And... It's very interesting how uh, this example here, where Abraham is offering up his son Isaac on the altar, is from Genesis 22. And James, in verse 23, is gonna, he's going to quote from Genesis 15 and verse 6, which, good Bible students that you are, you know that is a key text in Paul's arguments when he is talking about uh, justification by faith which shows us not that Paul and James are going heads up here and are contradictory. The same spirit that moved James to write his epistles, the same spirit that moved Paul to write his corpus of work. So we shouldn't expect the Holy Spirit to be working cross-purposes with the Holy Spirit. But rather, recognizing that each human writer of Scripture has a particular situation that they are speaking into. And a particular... So Paul has his purpose when he writes Romans and Galatians, those, those epistles that he, he really focuses on justification by faith. Just as James has his particular situation that he's writing into to talk about justification by works. Uh, and, and so that has bearing upon Paul's usage of Genesis 15 and verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And James has his particular way in which he utilizes that same exact text. Which shows us, by the way, uh, the depth of Scripture. That the same verse can be utilized to speak into one situation and it can also be utilized to speak into another situation. Right? Some, someone has talked about how uh, scripture, so deep an elephant can drown in it. And yet, it's so easy to grasp that a child can wade into it and there's no fear of the child drowning, right? This is the nature of the Word of God, which again is what we have. When it comes to Paul and his use of Genesis 15 and verse 6, he does emphasize the when. There's, there's a, a particular 
chronology here in the life of Abraham that he stresses. James, and the way he uses Genesis 15, 6, it's more of like, um, it's like a, a, a purpose statement for the life of Abraham, that it's applicable to all of Abraham's life. And, and so what is spoken about Abraham in Genesis 15 and verse 6, of course is going to have bearing Years later, when, when that word here in verse 23 is spoken about Abraham in Genesis 15, Isaac hadn't even been born yet, right? We're years away from that. But what was spoken then is fulfilled later on in Abraham's life when he does have the son of promise, which is Isaac, and they take the trip to Mount Moriah and in Genesis 22, and he is commanded, you, you sacrifice your son, right? Which... In the overarching argument of what James is talking about here, right? We talked about the concrete. You're claiming to have concrete. You have the cement. Where's the... James speaking to these Christians, speaking to us as well, is saying, look, you claim to have faith. You believe in God. Well and good. We could ask it this way. Where's your sacrifice? You see, Abraham, you see his sacrifice. Take your son, your only son, your beloved son. Go to the mountain, lay him on the altar, sacrifice him. This is the child of promise. This is the one they've been waiting on. This is the one they engaged in sin and rebellion against God the first time with Hagar and Ishmael and that whole episode. And God has, he offers the corrective. And now you've got him. And God says, go sacrifice him. Um, Soren Kierkegaard has, has written a book about, just approaches Genesis 22, that one chapter, from a number of different angles. And in, in some cases, it's, the way he approaches it is, is very much like a narrative, very much like, a, like prose, like a story. Put yourself into Abraham's shoes. Abraham believed God. He believed God. It's credited to him as righteousness. You got that standing, that declaration from God? Show me. By the way, who's Abraham showing his faith to? It's just him and Isaac on the mountain. It's God. That's why God, God says, now I know. Did God not know? He, God knows everything, right? And yet, he is demonstrating his faith to God, and there's also something that Abraham has learned about himself. And also, of course, since this is codified in Scripture, it's showing us as well. Even all, we're, what, nearly 4,000 years removed from Abraham, and we can still look back into Genesis 22, and we can see, yep, he showed us. When he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. Verse 22, you see that faith was active along with his works. Abraham, it wasn't just, it wasn't something he just talked about, just made the profession. Yeah, you know, I mean, I heard the voice all those years ago and he called me and, and all that. And he gave me the promise, your descendants will be like the stars of the heaven. And, you know, I, I believed him. That faith was active. It was an active faith. It was a living faith that produced works in keeping with that righteous declaration. And faith was, uh, his faith was completed by his works. And so here's the summary well, uh, verse 23, the Scripture was fulfilled. Very interesting. His faith is complete. Scripture is fulfilled. And uh, those two things uh, going together here, um, the Scripture and his faith. Uh, as I mentioned, he, he, James quotes here from Genesis 15 and verse 6. And on top of that, not only did Abraham show the truth of Scripture, which seems to be the idea here of the fulfillment of it. 
He was called a friend of God. This is uh, stated about Abraham in a number of places in, in our Old Testament. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. Psalm 25, 14. Isaiah 41, 8. And, and here's the thing. What was true about Abraham is also true for us if we have this living faith that seeks to obey God and do the things that He has called us to do. What was it Jesus said to His disciples the night before He went to the cross? He says, I, I call you friends. You want to be a friend of Jesus? You want to be His friend? And have that, that close, personal relationship with Him. You can't just call Him Lord, Lord. Do what He says. This is what James is after. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And again, faith alone here is that I believe that God is one. You know, may, may, you could work your way through all of the points of doctrine and have com complete and full agreement. You can have the Bible memorized from Genesis to Maps, but it, it doesn't manifest in obedience to God. That's the faith alone that James is talking about here. And then the, the second example is uh, verse 25. And in the same way, in the same way that Abraham was shown to have a true faith by his works, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Now for this, again, this, Abraham's the well-known case. This is, again, maybe not as well-known. But you go back to Joshua chapter 2, and this is, this is the account concerning Rahab. You have a couple of spies who show up in the land, the land that God had promised His people. They're scoping it out. and um, When they show up uh, in, in town, they, uh, they go, this is Jericho, they go and they find a, a woman who is hospitable to them named Rahab. And as I mentioned earlier, Rahab, the text says, just as J uh, James affirms, she was a woman of uh, questionable moral background, right? She's got a testimony. Word gets to the king of Jericho about these spies, and so he sends some guys to go get them. And they show up at Rahab's doorstep. She's got a couple of options here. Option A is... Yeah, they're right here. And, and save her own skin, as it were. Turn the spies over to an uncertain fate. Or, on the other hand, what she does, which is um, verse 6. Joshua 2, verse 6. She had brought them, the spies, brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. She hid them. And then, on top of that, she lied. <laughs> she lied to the, the soldiers that showed up and said, oh, they went that way, right? Hurry, you, you can get them if you hurry, right? But then it gets deeper than that, right? Because you think about this. What's in store for the city of Jericho? The just judgment of God that will result in the complete annihilation of the city as well as the population. She has committed an act of treason against her own people. In the Rahab story, there is sin all over the place. 
And yet, God utilizes this woman as an example of faith. You read what she says here in verses 9 through 13. Joshua 2, she says to the men, I know that Yahweh has given you the land. Notice this. This is, this is her statement of faith. I know Yahweh has given you the land. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For I have heard, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, I have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan in Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction, and as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in us, uh, in any man because of you. For Yahweh your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. You believe that God is one. There it is. She has faith in the one true and only God. Uses his name, Yahweh. Now then, please swear to me by Yahweh that, as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign. A sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. This is a woman who, you hear her faith. She makes a profession of faith in the one true only God, Yahweh. Then she, where's your sacrifice? Here's her sacrifice. She engages in this treason and act, treasonous act, which would have led to her death. Capital punishment. And she's willing to do that because of her faith in the God who dries up the Red Sea, the God who has redeemed his people from. She has chosen solidarity with Yahweh. She has pledged her allegiance, and it is manifested in, I'm, I'm going to show kindness to his people who have shown up on my doorstep, even though it means I have to turn my back on my fellow countrymen. This is the example that James leans into here. Coming back to James 2 and verse 25 is Rahab. And we spent a little more time here because, again, her story may not be as well known. And yet, he puts her on par with Abraham. Here is on the one hand, Abraham, he was a Hebrew, the first one who's called a Hebrew in Scripture. He's the father of the chosen nation. Here's Rahab, and, and she is not a Hebrew person. She, she's, she's a non-Jewish person. She is a Gentile who is outside of the nation. You have Abraham. He had direct communication from God on more than one occasion. And years of instruction in the school of faith. Here's Rahab. She had none of those. She didn't have God directly communicating with her. She'd heard about it. Word had gotten out about this God who showed up and redeemed his people by drying up the Red Sea. Abraham, most People would probably look at his life, and yeah, I mean, he, he's a sinner like the rest of us, but basically, we'd say, oh, that's a good guy. Rahab? Mm. Prostitute. Right? And yet, both of these individuals find their place in the people of God. Both of them have faith, true faith that manifests in obedience to the one true and only God. The other thing is, think about this, the size of the sacrifice of Abraham. 
Your son, your beloved son, the son of promise, lay him on the altar. His hand, of course, is stayed by the angel. Man. Ooh. Man, I, that's, I can't do that. Can you choose solidarity with God's people? And, and I mean, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem as big as they, she sent the messengers by another way. And sent the, uh, she sent the messengers out one way, sent the, the, the guys who were chasing them off another way. It's a, it, it, it's, it doesn't seem to have the same weight as Abraham's. And yet, justified. Shown to be of the people of God based on this. Verse 25 is uh, put to the people as a question. And it anticipates that they would be in agreement with it, of course. 4, verse 26 is, is again just summarizing the whole argument thus far. As the body apart from the spirit is dead. That's that. This is one of the texts that we come to when we talk about our composition as human beings. We are not just uh, material machines. We are not just sacks of mostly water, right? There is more to human beings than meets the eye. There's a spiritual component. And, and here is our, uh, our theology of death, that when a person dies, what, what that is, is the physical body does remain behind, but the spiritual part of us, the spirit, the soul, departs. And from elsewhere, we, we understand it goes to the unseen realm of disembodied spirits to wait for the judgment and the resurrection and, and those sorts of things. Again, this is, James is leaning into common knowledge for these people, his brothers and sisters. You know that the body without the spirit is dead. So also faith, apart from works, is dead. And again, this, this is confrontational to those who they were making this claim to have faith, but they didn't have works. That's a dead faith. Years later, James's half-brother Jesus, the Lord himself, writes several New Testament postcards to, to seven churches in Asia Minor. One of those churches is the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus speaking here, he says, to the angel, could also be translated as messenger, but to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know, I know your works. I want you to see this, that this, this is scalable, right down to the individual Christian and all the way to the church at large, the body. I know your works. He's writing to the church, to Christians in Sardis. Notice, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Apparently, these Christians in Sardis didn't have a copy of James's epistle at this time. That's part of the history here of the, the, the compilation of the New Testament documents. Because what they apparently have is a faith that doesn't have the works that is supposed to accompany such a faith. And so while they talk a good game and apparently have this reputation of being alive, Jesus knows the heart. He knows Christians. He knows churches. And he, the omniscient cardiologist, says, you're dead. What is the remedy for, whether it's an individual Christian or an entire church, when it comes to being confronted with a dead faith? Do you despair? There's no hope. What can I do? Do you rebel? Go on. 
I'm going to keep, do, keep doing me. Jesus Himself gives us the remedy. Wake up. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. You see, James is, is talking, show me. He's talking about how we demonstrate to one another that we have a true saving faith, that we are justified and declared righteous. you got to live like it. But truly the person that we show, it's just like Abraham. You show this to God. You live your life in the sight of God Almighty. You believe in Him, just like Abraham believed God. You've been declared righteous before Him. Now you got to live like it. Obey Him. Do what He says. Follow hard after Jesus in His footsteps. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit and allow Him to produce the fruit in your life. The prescription, whether it's a church that is dying or an individual who has a dead faith, from James and from Jesus, is wake up. And do those works that are in keeping with the kingdom of God and King Jesus himself. Let's commit this to God in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, you are so good to us. You've blessed us in so many ways with a with the gospel and with faith and with the righteous standing before you in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that we would be people who are eager to have a living faith, that our faith would never be just merely spoken. Not a mere profession, but a practice. A life of obedience. A life that shows the life of Christ in our hearts, in our minds, in all that we do. And so, Father, help us by your Holy Spirit within us to take your word and to put it into practice. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We proclaim the mystery of faith. That